Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the first event of uh, the semester, the first social justice center event of the semester. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all in person and uh, on Zoom. We have quite a few um, participants on Zoom as well. Uh, and I'd like to welcome uh, Associate Professor Silvano de la Yata, uh, to give today's talk, which will be titled Tear Gas Questions for Activists, Creative Resistance in the Age of Reactants. Um, as you know, I imagine you know, this talk is part of the Social Justice Speaker Series of the Center. And the center is co-directed by Pablo Gillibert, uh, professor at the Department of Philosophy, who's joining us on Zoom, and myself, uh, Ben Yaku, the Social the Program of Planning and Environment, the very same uh, department that Silvano is based at. Um, Dr. Silvano de la Yata is an urbanist and an educator and associate professor at the Department of Program of Planning and Environment. For the last 15 years, his research has focused on public space and the study of alternative uses, such as street vending, graffiti, public assembly and protests, and design and planning agents. He did research and participated in the Indignados mobilizations in Barcelona, Occupy Wall Street, and other social movements in 2011 and 2012. Building on this experience, he directs the project Cities X Citizens or Cities, cities by Citizens. Citizens, cities by citizens. Okay which focuses on the democratization of planning and urban design through participatory design methodologies and open source systems. Bridging research, pedagogy, and redesign practice, we developed urban design methodologies, open planning and planning in situ, to redesign interstitial spaces in Montreal through collaborative community engagement. Uh, before I give the floor to Silvano, I would like to uh, start acknowledging the lands we're on uh, acknowledging the indigenous peoples in the Ghanaian Dahaka nation, uh, who are the custodians of the lands uh, we are today. Uh, as researchers in social justice, uh, we are committed to encouraging everyone to learn about indigenous struggles, to support indigenous struggles for self determination, and to actively resist colonialism and neo colonialism. I would, uh, and again, before I give the floor to Silvano, um, we will have a question and answer period after the talk. And if you're joining us on Zoom, you can use the raise hand um, function of Zoom, or you can uh, directly uh, type up your, uh, your questions on the chat. And we can ask the question in French, Christian, or for me, on the Apple and um and one last thing, <laughs> our next talk, um, next Social Justice Speaker Series event will be on October 28th in room uh, 1252. It's going to be an event curated and led by Stefan Christoph. I will send uh, information on that shortly. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Silvana Bellia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bengi. Thank you, Christian. Thank you for the Social Justice Center for inviting me. Uh, to give this talk. I'm going to be sharing uh, some questions, posing some questions and sharing a little bit of my research that I did uh, already 10 years ago and that I have now incorporated and that is inspiring the work that I'm doing currently, but it's also inspiring me to reflect about some questions that I believe are crucial to ask in social movements and social struggles. And so I would like to start by posing a question deliberately vague and provocative or that I feel is adequate for the Social Justice Center. The question is very simple. Do you want to change the world? <laughs> is that something that crosses your mind with such simplicity? Oh. <laughs> it's a very it is a very simple question and it's deliberately vague. Uh, how many of you think that you would be able to change the world if it was for some people that is in the way? <laughs> also deliberately vague. How many of you think those people gather and conspire to stop you from changing the world? Of course. Of course, right? So we think of 
questions like that. And I bet you have been at some point being questioned or questioning things like this, for saying things with such simplicity, and perhaps for sometimes when you were younger, expressing this uh, just like that, right? Do you want to change the world? So you have been perhaps being accused of being naive for stating questions like that, right? Perhaps um, childish, infantile. That's how I felt when I was posing questions like that. When I pose questions like that, so it's like, you're naive, you're childish. That is something that a child would say. And you really bother me when people said things like that. So I started reflecting a lot about the issue. I started doing research and reading about it a lot. And so I could have an answer for those people who said things like that to me. And I say that it's not childish. It's not infantile. However, it's adolescent. <laughs> <laughs> to pose things like that. So things like this are things that a child wouldn't say, a teenager would, right? So there's an improvement here. There's a little bit of, yeah, in, in, in the maturity process, we're no longer children. We are at the moment of transformation. We are becoming something else, right? That's the epitome of adolescence. What does adolescent or ad an adolescence mean? In English, it doesn't have much reference, at least in terms of the etymology, but it's a Latin voice. What does it mean? Where does it come from? I'm thinking of for those who speak French or another Latin language. Adonis or <laughs> comes from comes from pain. Right, mm -hmm. it means to go through pain. When you go through pain, it means that you are adolescent in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Adolescer. It means that you're going through a certain difficult process because you're becoming something else. Because growth hurts, literally. Literally, when you're growing, I have a nine-year-old who says, "Oh, my legs hurt," and the doctor says, "That's because you're growing." You know. And, um, but what does it mean? How do we, um, how do we, there's feedback. Okay. Sorry. That good? Should work. All right. How, how do we, what are the things that we feel when we are teenagers? How do we know when we have arrived at that point. <laughs> How did you know? It's super painful. It's a painful, <laughs> of course, yeah. How do, how did we, how, when did you realize that you were no longer a child? Is that, is that a realization that hit you at some point? Mm -hmm. Anybody? <laughs> Resistance to Re parents, to authority. Re Thank you for that. That's exactly what I was doing. There's resistance to your parents, right? You hate your parents. And why is that? Because you're going through a process of individuation. You're going through a process of finding your own identity. And since you have had continuity throughout your life with these two people or, or whatever type of family you're in, you have had that continuity. Maybe there's an extended family Maybe uh, there are certain institutions, maybe there's a church, maybe there's your religion, maybe there's your school. All of that is what you know and is continuous since you were born. So you want to find identity by differentiation, right? It doesn't mean that you, I mean, maybe you do hate your, your parents at that point, but what you really are trying to articulate is a language of your own. And the only way you can do it is by saying, that's what I don't want. I am not these guys. I'm a different thing. So you're saying no to that. That's the first step. It's a step of differentiation. It's saying, I am 
myself and I'm, I am my own person. And in order to do that, I need to depart from the identity that I have. Now, what the hell does that got to do with social movements? Well, a lot, because that's a necessary step that we need to take. And it's an important one, and but we need to overcome it because individuation and finding our own identity has to go beyond the sole act of differentiation. Why is that? Because when we do that, what we tend to do is to develop a language that is in function of the other and in function of another thing. In other words, we fall into what I call in this paper, the anti-stage of social movements. We're anti this, anti that. And we speak always in function of something else. That is something that happens in all processes of individuation, not necessarily only in social movements. It happens also in, in uh, when you go through a spiritual transformation. So you, you would hear people that are becoming of another religion speaking a lot about the other thing. We used to have a friend back in college that we used I we really disagreed so much. He was a fundamentalist religious uh, person. And all he talked about was the devil. That's all he talked about. Mm -hmm. Every time I was always thinking, is this guy about the devil? Because that's all he talks about. Every time he wanted to make a point for his new transformation, his new spiritual transformation, he cited the devil. And he said things that were the opposite of what we used to say. He would say things like, the devil or Satan, we call it Satan, operates in mysterious ways. And I, said, oh, I always thought it was the Lord speaks in mysterious ways. <laughs> <laughs> That's a completely a complete shift. And uh, it really made me think. So it's, as I was doing this research that has been going on for a while, I was also thinking about this thing. These transformations always come by differentiation. It happened. It happens in social movements. It happens a lot. It has, it has happened throughout history. It's a necessary step to take, but it's even more important to overcome it. Because what happens when we stay there is that we start dwelling in reactiveness. We start dwelling in an anti-stage. Ultimately, we start dwelling in resentment. We start always thinking of the oppressor as something out there. And I am anti that thing. I'm not yet myself. I have not left my parents' house. What happens when you're a teenager? Maybe you wake up, it's a Sunday morning, you're in your pajamas. You wake up, you tell your parents, hey, you guys, number one, this person I want to tell you. <laughs> and number two, What's for breakfast, <laughs> right? And so that you're still there, but you hate them, but you're still part of the same thing, but you know that you don't want to be like them. That's a typical stage of adolescence and is really painful, hence the idea of uh, Sadolesia, right? So I got a little concerned because you connected oh, yeah. the projector to this computer, but so. At first, it was connected on this. All right. Computer. Do you know what you did? Do I know what I did? <laughs> yeah, because it, uh, we don't see. We see only your. Uh, we see only this. Mm -hmm. um, I connect there. I downloaded it. Yeah, I know what I did here. So how could we connect this one to the know, screen? I I don't know. Let's let's since okay. we're already I'm already let's, on our let's, 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 let's do let's both. Do, yeah. do both, okay? All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's gonna stop momentum and that's not good. All right. <laughs> Sorry. And we're gonna lose the audience also. Okay, I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> so several things I wanna talk about. We talk a lot about ideas, right? In in um social movements, yeah, there are a lot of ideas. We always have a lot of ideas, sometimes we cycle ideas. But we don't talk a lot about action. We talk about action in function of ideas. And one thing that we don't talk about a lot are attitudes. 
So attitudes are very important. How do we engage? How do we participate in this life? How do we participate in struggles through productive, effective attitudes? Um, and so I'm going to be talking about now, moving on to social movements and the research that I've been doing. I'm going to be drawing, first, I'm going to be drawing from, from this metaphor that I brought up. Um, you guys, the idea of adolescence, and the idea of transformation, the idea of transcendence, the idea of resistance, and what it's called in the literature, refusal. Refusal is important. It is a moment of recognition of what you are not. So we're gonna talk about three main um, ideas that were discussed in the social movements of 2011 and 12, the Indignados movement, um, Occupy Wall Street, um, the Yo 132, the Quebec student movement, the Chilean student movement, the occupation of Taksim Square in Istanbul, uh, even all the way to the umbrella movement in Hong Kong. So that period between 2000, late 2010 and, and, and the middle of 2014. So this is what is called um, the square movement, these movements of occupation that were seminal for these uh, new ways of thinking about resistance in the age of information. So three things uh, we're gonna be talking about. Refusal, destituent power, and creative resistance. All of these voices were always there. The, it, this was um, practical theory that people were discussing explicitly or implicitly something, sometimes, um, some, 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 something we forget as activists is, is that activists and theorists are sometimes the same thing. We have organic intellectuals all the time. This idea that there are theories and there are activists as a separate uh, body of, of, of um, in, in the struggle it is, is not true. So I'm gonna be pulling from, from these two uh, movements. So during a period of three years or so, I did. I had the opportunity to travel a lot and follow these social movements. I started by looking at the movement of uh, the Indignados uh, in Barcelona. Uh, as I was in a conference, I was very excited. I was in Rome and I read about this and I took the plane immediately to Barcelona. I thought I, I, need, to, I need to learn about this. And then six months or so after, I started hearing about this thing called Occupy Wall Street um, in the media that was produced at the Indignados movement. Um, there was a whole, in, in all of these movements, they had a very strong sense of international internationalism. So a lot of communication. So they always had a section um, or presentations from other social movements. So they would say things like, uh, here are the brothers or the sisters from um, Spain or aquí están los compañeros de Nueva York, for example. In, in, interestingly, in Spain, the uh, Occupy Wall Street were called Los Indignados de Nueva York, for example. <laughs> um, then, um, then when I learned about that, there was this protest that was done in solidarity with Occupy in Barcelona, so I thought, now I have to go to New York. <laughs> so I took the plane to New York, and I started doing not a comparative study, but uh, what I call a hyper ethnography, because I was following the social uh, networks and being in the, in the uh, assemblies as much as I could. And then later, other movements came about in my home country, Mexico, the Yo 132 movement, came out inspired by the indignados and they inspired uh, each other mutually. So I was able uh, to go to Mexico City. And then when I was in Europe, also France had a version of the uh, indignados. And then I was able to come to Montreal right after um, the, the social movement organized, the strikes of 2012 uh, happened. These movements were all about, like the name says it, indignation. That, um, like I mentioned, in the literature, 
it falls under this idea of refusal. And refusal um, is something that has been discussed for 70 years or so, especially in movements that came out of critical thinkers that came about after the, the Second World War. Camus was one of them when um, he wrote uh, Long Revolte. One of the things he mentioned is that that cry of no is very important. Refusal is about saying no. And is very empathic. It's, it's a moment of differentiation. Is when you acknowledge that there is injustice and you acknowledge that you want to become someone else. So you're saying no to the current order of things. Um, this was very much inspired by this little pamphlet written by uh, Stefan Hessel, who was the last survivor, um, the last surviving redactor of the Declaration, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. He participated in the French resistance, so he fought against the Nazis. He was this important senior voice in social movements that said, okay, how come we are not upset about what's going on here? One of the things that upset uh, him um, most significantly were the violations of human rights, what was going on in, in Palestine, uh, Guantanamo and all these black sites, he said, okay, we fought for this. How come we have concentration camps again? Like we gave our lives for that. And then he feels that that's a mission. He's 98 or something like that. And he says, I can't go without saying this. It's important that we acknowledge that we did this for something. In Spain, they kind of adopt this idea of uh, Les Indignes, right? Los Indignados and France as well. In Europe, is mostly framed as this notion of indignation. The, the pamphlet is translated as time for outrage, so this moment of outrage. And it's a moment of no, it's a moment of refusal. Where, where do we find this in, in the literature? We find it all over. Marina Citrin was a, in a way an organic um, intellectual who participated in the planning of Occupy Wall Street. She was always there. She said, um, these, our movements are the shouting of no, the ya basta, already, enough already, is that Zapatistas, the que se vayan todos, that's the Argentinians, they almost go. They are our collective refusal to remain passive in an untenable situation. So that's a very clear um, a statement uh, in favor of refusal. Then uh, this is from a solidarity um, communique that was sent from the occupiers of Tahrir Square from Cairo to um, Occupy Wall Street. They say an entire generation across the globe has grown of realizing rationally and emotionally that we have no future in the current order of things. So again, statement about we have to do something different. Okay. Mm. Well, uh, this is this is Stefan Hessel. We can skip this one, um, but um, we have Camus here in in the forties. He writes, "A rebel is someone who says no." But those, but but whose refusal does not imply a renunciation, but also says yes from the moment he or she or her first gesture of rebellion. Thus, saying no affirms the existence of a borderline. And this is, I would say, the, the, the main objective of my talk, to start thinking about how can we move away from the no and start saying yes. How, when are we gonna leave our parents' house and actually build a new existence that is not anti-mom and anti-dad, but that is, a different way of thinking about ourselves in which we can articulate things with our own words without referring perpetually to the other as the enemy. Because we know the history of that. Once the Tsar is gone and is dead, 
then you have to look for new enemies. And then it's Trotsky and you have to kill him. And once the Shah is gone, then it's all of the citizens, right? It happens over and over. Once the king is dead, then it's the Girondins and you have to cut their heads and so on and so on. And we go in this perpetual stage of hegemony and counter hegemony where there is always someone else who's not letting you do things. It's good that we know that we don't want the czar. It's good that we know that we don't want the Shah. It's good that we know that we don't want Porfirio Diaz. It's good that we know that we don't want uh, Batista, right? But what do we want? Can we are actually articulate that without citing them all of the time? That is a, a question that people don't like. Hence the name of the talk, Tear Gas Questions. Every time I ask questions myself, and people in the assembly, there were all sorts of interesting questions. But every time the question was, what are we going to do about it? Can we articulate a form of resistance with language of our own? People had to go to the bathroom and never came back. <laughs> people had other better things to do. And they never came back because they have developed an identity on the basis of the other. I'm not my mom. I'm not my dad. And that's how they think that they define themselves. And that's fine. And it's a painful, and that's fine for a moment. It's a painful moment. Again, hence the name adolescence, but we have to go over it if we want to find our own voice. Um, then there's also Holloway, of course, a scream of sadness, a scream of horror, a scream of anger, a scream of refusal. No, that uh, is again, openly referring to the notion of, of refusal. Um, Marcuse talks about that, the notion of the great refusal. And he's, he writes about that when he refers to the movements of uh, 1968 uh, across the world. So a, there's a whole generation of students and young people who are saying no. And he calls it the great refusal. In this moment where you say no. So again, this is something that is in the spirit um, of, of creating a new world. It's, it's a kickstart for you. It's triggering the reflection. And it's no coincidence that this happens at a generational turning point after the First World War then at, in 68. And then 2011 and 12, you have these new internet natives, some people that were actually born uh, when the internet was already around, that are trying to articulate their thoughts of resistance in a different way. Uh, it's been 10 years of that, and it's good that we have been saying no, but I think it's time to start to look for ways to say yes to certain things. We need to start moving on and developing our own language. We live in a reactive um, society. We live in a reactive generation. We see it all of the time, the way the social networks uh, work. Again, um, the Indignados and Occupy come about because um, of social networks and the internet in many ways. So not surprisingly, it is, it is informed by these aesthetics of reactions. And it's fine that we have these reactions because we have that layer in our humanity. We do have reactions and it's good to love something and to laugh at something and to be awed at something, to be sad and angry, but we can do more than that. We can go beyond that soul stage of just reacting and we can do more than just being outraged all of the time about stuff going on in the internet or in real life. And we can do a lot more than just saying no, and especially in the internet. We can do a lot more than just sitting there and putting up a hashtag and saying that we're really, 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 really angry about something. We can do more than that. It's fine that we feel that. It's fine that you're provoked and inspired to do something different, but we are more than these emotions, because all of these emotions, uh, with all the respect, can be also felt 
by other animals. We can do more than that. We can, we can go beyond that stage. We see that also in all in the culture, right? That that culture of reacting. You see something and then you react. And then the production is cyclically reactive all of the time. There are videos and material that is posted and then people react and then people react to the reaction and it really um, um, becomes a, a crisis of reactiveness, which is what I'm arguing in, in this paper. It, it is, it puts us on the seat of the spectator, puts us on the seat of the consumer also of material and we don't move towards the position of becoming actors in the play and producers of a different and new reality. All of this is what I call is the, the anti stage. I'll give you um, at the end uh, the reference for, for the paper. Um, ultimately, <laughs> these attitudes are life denying. That's what, uh, what Nietzsche calls life denying attitude. When you start just punishing yourself for your existential footprint. Really, this is something that we see now more and more. We see more with younger generations. Oh, I gentrify, I studentify. You didn't know what that meant, the professor? I studentify, let me tell you about it. And then my carbon footprint. And then, and all of this is important. Yes, you do have a footprint in the world, but to go back to this idea of the devil, working in mysterious ways, that resembles a lot that um, typical feeling of, of, of the original sin, right? Mm -hmm. You are guilty for being born. You owe something to the world. And unless you don't acknowledge that, you don't deserve to be alive. And that is a terrible way uh, to start a new life if you hate yourself because you can't articulate your own uh, language. And we can do better than that. We can go beyond that. And we can strive for life-affirming uh, attitudes in the world that are productive, creative, um, and that look towards a process of finding a new identity. So there is this other idea that was discussed a lot during um, during these movements, especially in in um, in the Spanish-speaking world, but but uh, French as well, and it's became uh, more mainstream when there was a translation of a of a conference that Agamben gave uh, in Rome, and he. They, they started using the, the voice of destitute power, which is confusing because in English we have this, the, the word destitute, which is often related to poor or someone who fell of the grace of something. But here destituent uh, as is, uh, or, or, or the Latin voice um, um, destituyente in Spanish, um, which is where it really took off. Like, this is basically Zapatistas and the Argentinian movements of the early, um, of the turn of the century. In this idea that we work in, in reaction to, to constituent power. So there is a constituent power, which is something that uh, Hart and Negri talk about broadly, the idea of, um, of a, a power that is constituted and one that is constituent. One, and he draws from the Luz and Gattari this idea that something is finished and then a constituent power is something that is becoming all of the time. During these days, and especially since after the Que se vayan todos movement of the Argentinas, people start talking about poder destituyente, which means que se vayan todos. Kind of like a let's break it all kind of um, feeling, which is also a result of this culture of outrage this culture of refusal, we don't want this, we want to break it all, right? But you're still in your parents' house, right? You wanna kick around stuff in the kitchen and in your room 
you're still in your parents' house. You still haven't developed <laughs> this, this um, language of, of your own. Um, so here is um, what I propose is that we move away, but having incorporated that process of refusal, having said no to all of these things that we don't agree with, let's start thinking about to what are we going to say yes to. And here is where creativity is very important. In these movements, this doesn't mean that there were three factions. This doesn't mean that there were three stages. There were people that were using this language at the same time. Some people, somebody would say, you use a refusal uh, discourse. And then later they would talk about breaking it all more in the spirit of the, um, the student power. And then there were a lot of experiments, which is something that kind of faded uh, away in this struggle because it wasn't the loudest uh, voice. And, and that's a problem. We need to bring that spirit back because yes, in this stage of reactiveness, in this stage of outrage and the call of culture and all of these things, that is the loudest voice in the room it is the saying no all of the time and is the anti this, anti that, anti other things because we still don't have that language. And in order for us to become somebody different, at least we need the words to articulate it. If we don't have that, then we can't become somebody different. So first, refusal is the acknowledgement of injustice. The Stephen power is the intention to end it injustice. And creative resistance is actually looking for alternatives to injustice. So actually planning something different. So the question becomes more, how do I become who I'm meant to be? Which is, I think, a question we all face at some point, hopefully after um, that period of tremendous pain and transformation. Creator resistance has different manifestations, but here I'm going to mention uh, only some that were discussed, and some of the voices came from people um, that were in the movement, weren't uh, theories or anything like that, but sometimes they came from people who went to these movements, because let's not forget that all throughout these movements, there were professors and theories and writers visiting. Um, you had uh, David Harvey visiting Occupy Wall Street, Occupy London, you had Angela Davis, you had uh, Judy Butler, and, but also musicians like Tom Morello, you have Slavo Zizek, you had, um, um, well, David Graeber, who's also considered like a, 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 an integral part of Occupy Wall Street and so on. You have many voices like that. And I think that the voice of, of Zizek was particularly critical and it was, I don't know if it was well uh, understood when he participated there. And I, I think he was onto something when he said that to the occupiers of Occupy Wall Street, don't fall in love with yourselves. And I think what he's referring to and the way he's seeing himself in this uh, discussion is as uh, uh, he, he feels inspired by the position that Lacan uh, took in 68. Because he was the only intellectual of that generation who was not convinced with 68. He was famous for saying, what you're looking for is a new master and you're gonna find it. And Foucault said uh, whatever, and Sartre said whatever, and Deleuze said whatever, this is exciting, right? And Lacan said, I don't know about that. And a lot of, well, some critical intellectuals, um, Zizek being a, Lac a Lacanian would say, we are now in a stage where we are obliged to, to adopt the logics of 68. And we can also find that new, that, um, that new master. And that master can be anything. And in, in a post 68, it can also be pleasure when we look at uh, Lacanian um, um, psychology. In this case, Zizek was onto something when he asked, 
he, this is it is a long speech where he says that in all of these movies, because he's also a film critic, as you probably know, <laughs> he talks about how we can portray the end of the world by an extraterrestrial invasion, by world catastrophes, but we can't really picture the end of capitalism. It's something that we still don't have the words to articulate. And that is the main question. How do we imagine a different world and how do we plan to start creating it without saying, I'm not my mom, I'm not my dad, without saying the devil works in mysterious ways. How do we find a new truth without being always something that is not the other? Can we move onto a more mature type of resistance that is more creative? And this is uh, where we can think of this concept that was also very inspirational during uh, these movements, especially in Occupy Wall Street, the notion of prefigurative politics. This is not a new idea. It goes back all the way to uh, movements of resistance through the mid um, and early 20th century. Perhaps Gandhi is a, the most um, prominent figure in when we think of prefigurative politics. And this is him in his famous uh, salt march. When he does a very simple gesture, there is a monopoly on the production of salt by the British. And then he's there producing, breaking the monopoly by just engaging and doing it. You don't petition, you don't sign stuff, you don't ask for permission, and you don't protest, you do it. You start doing it. All of that, everybody puts it, uh, be the change you want to see and all of that, that's what it means. It means doing things, being creative, being proactive and start thinking of developing a, a language of your own. And Gandhi was very keen on that. We need to develop our new, a new language. What does it mean to be Indians? What does it mean to be an independent nation? What does it mean uh, when we reflect about from ourselves, not in contrast of the British and so on? How do we develop a new language that is that is empowering and ultimately life affirming? And again, so this transcends this feeling of feeling uh, of of life denying and self loathing um, uh, notions and feelings uh, about our existential footprint, right? And the secularized um, original sin that we live so much nowadays. It's reactive in many ways. It's reactive in a language, it's reactive in an artist, and, and, it's, and it, it, it's it's also the, all this language of shaming, shaming from all sides and of self-loathing, right? Like, oh, how much I destroy the world and so on. Yes, but I guess that the most important question is, uh, and this is where I uh, want to move on, is what are we going to do about it? So th th there were there were many um, interesting experiments, and like like I said, these voices kind of um, faded out in, in the movement. It was it, it became the, it was it, it it became the establishment to say no and to be outraged in the internet and put up a hashtag and say no and becoming the anti generation. Um, but there was there were a lot of creative voices. There was music. There was there were art workshops. There were all sorts of um, things related to to dance and performance. There was uh, also experiments with the spirituality, pan-religious um, assemblies and meditation um, uh, groups, um, think tanks of all sorts. Well, that's what they called it, uh, think tanks, which were more like an assembly um, of focused more on creative, uh, proactive things. There were actual experiments with doing different things in, in terms of like what we do about money and then some barter um, networks and so on. There were symposia that were organized um, independently. There were spaces like this in, in Barcelona where they had a, a, a self-funded autonomous um, space with a library, with a little clinic, all of that came out of of the um, of the of, of the 15M movement with uh, services for elder people and so on. And these 
for some people who weren't that close to the notion of indignation, this, this people, some people start feeling that this was departing, but this was actually moving into the next stage with us actually started uh, thinking what are the things that we can do about uh, things and and, um, and how can we do it in a way in which we can move away from just acknowledging that there's an injustice. Um, Stephen Hessel actually wrote, and then no one paid attention to that. People were excited about saying no. And then he felt this is an important book to write. And then he wrote this and died very soon after, almost at, at the age of uh, 100 years. And, um, and what it, the, the question he wanted to stress is, we have to do something about it. Yes, but is very important. We have to do something. And how does that look like? What are the things that we can do? So I'd like to end with these um, questions that like the first question that I posed are very simple. And again, it is true that people really left when people ask this type of question. They left the assembly. They didn't want to know about what to do. Some people actually felt that their identity was being attacked because they had found an identity in saying no of what would Nietzsche would call a dwelling in resentment. He's like, no, but I want to stay here because that's, that's, that's my identity, right? So can I transcend, or can we transcend speaking in function of the other? Can we go beyond the anti-stage? Question number one. Question number two. Yeah, this is one that we don't. And then we don't want to talk about this. What is my what is what is the role that I play willingly or reluctantly, passively or actively, consciously or unconsciously in the interdependent network of power? We have to talk, if we want to talk about power, we have to think about power as a network that crosses us and in which we participate. If we think of power and then me all for me, and then there's power over there, and they oppress me, and I don't think that I participate actively, passively, consciously, or unconsciously, then we're never going to solve this interdependent, hyper-complex world in which we live in. Okay, this is really... And then ultimately, what are we going to do about it? Which can be summarized in the question, to what do we say yes? If we know the things that we're gonna say no to, what are the things that, are, that we are going to say yes to? Now I'd like to finish with this because that was the purpose of the talk is that some questions were posed and I invite now that, um, yeah, some questions that you might want to pose a question for myself. Thank you very much. Can you help me to fill it up? Thank you. Yeah. Any comments, questions? I'd like to hear about. Also, I'm sure that you participated in different struggles. Is it is this something that rings a bell? Yeah, that that resonates. Yeah. Hello, uh, Nicola. Hi, Nicola. I will graduate in geography, try to work on social movements, violent movements, and how they can be more intersectional, if you will. Um, from your talk, I hear um, that there's a lot to say yes to. I mean, there's been a lot of proposals. I myself was part of a unfortunately failed group that tried to bring a so called Leave Manifesto and try to ground it in so called Montreal. But also around uh, what was permitted as a big deal. But I mean, the kinds of um, manifestos out there, maybe you were part of one for eco socialist and Negro mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> And all these sorts of offerings that exist out there. But uh, I'm trying to make this quick, but I'm part of a coalition here in Quebec, the Hong Kong for the Joint Quebec. And it's been existing for seven years and it's been a tug of war between what you mentioned are the ones who prefer to be anti, say no to, mm -hmm. and those who want to have integrity in politics 
Yeah. Um, honestly, a lot of numbers are a mix of both because mm -hmm. in that particular space, there's inherent colonialism, toxic masculinity, and all these oppressive systems that exist outside the world that are important to be often reproduced. When we try to have these uh, spaces, um, and currently they're trying to do this strategic planning, and the dominant voices are the ones who are leading this, and again, pulling towards something that will be more of um, anti than um, building the world we want to live in. So I wonder if, uh, you know, around the space that we've been, we've seen over time these kind of things go about. And if you see it more as, you know, I'm trying not to become, you know, marked by a completely, but uh, the purpose of escape, would it play within this or not? Mm -hmm. And sorry, I have another question here. This one's quick. Uh, when you're saying reactive, is it you consider it by choice by the people or by design by the system? No, I, I think it's a personal choice to be reactive. I think we can choose to go beyond the reactive stage. I think the state or the status quo benefits from that reactiveness, from that culture of just saying no all of the time and then fighting among each other and then and then there is also i mean there's there's recent reflections about why and how um the powerful also benefit a lot from from that culture as well from from, from people being outraged they join the outrage that's something we've, we've seen, right? Like, like Hollywood like, is joining the outreach. She's so like, the whole yeah. thing in the climate march. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's exactly that. Who won? Trudeau. Yeah. Yeah. Trudeau. Trudeau. Yeah. 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 Trudeau won't like the first climate march in Montreal. Yeah. Like we're literally asking him to do something, and he's like, "I joined the outrage. I'm outraged <laughs> by yeah. myself not doing anything about this." The state does it, but but capitalists do it. A lot, and we have this fake idea that they're joining our causes, right? Because they put up a hashtag and they're like, "Yeah, we support so and so," uh, and they benefit because they were losing a little bit of a market, right? With all of the people that are progressive and so on, and now they think, "Okay, now now I, oh, I'm not selling. I'm losing ten percent of my sales because these people." Are progressive so i'm gonna say that i'm progressive and then i'm gonna put up all of these i'm gonna co-opt this discourse sometimes it's co-opted and it also comes from them from them as well so we, i feel like it, it is a good moment to try to break free from that as well because I, I feel like that that language is, is is very um that discourse is very unproductive and ultimately futile. Yeah. Uh, Pablo has a question online. Okay. Uh, Pablo? Yes. You can go ahead and ask your question, but I just want to let you know, sadly, I don't know why, but the uh, the room here can hear you, but they cannot see you. Okay, okay why not? Okay, so, um, all right. So I should be visible because I, on my Zoom, uh, I, I see the, the image anyway. All right. Well, I'm, I'm I'm sorry you cannot see me, Silvano. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, it, was, uh, it was exciting, and I especially like the map uh, you have there in the. Oh, <laughs> <thanks>. <laughs> yeah, <I just> <laughs> but uh, so thank you. I, I really like the talk, and uh, I like the this this approach that you have, uh, and the, the importance of moving from the negative to the uh, constructive or or productive moment. Uh, I I I I had a question about. Uh, how do you see in particular the, the positive side of the, the, the positive dimension of prefiguration in this in these new social movements? No. So just for an analogy, so in the in the in the more traditional or classical Marxist view, uh, there was a view that uh, of uh, the workers' movements uh, and, and the uh, and the experience of the working class as already prefiguring a new form of uh, sociality. No. So uh, um, in the time of Marx, uh, there was this thought that uh, workers uh, were not just uh, rejecting capitalist organization, but already starting to, to experiment uh, with a so socialized form of organization of production. 
into the 20th century, if you think about Tony Negri and his reflections on the autonomous movement in, in Italy. So he thought that the, the new forms of, uh, of, of production in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the capitalism of, of that time involve uh, um, greater levels of, uh, of, uh, of cognitive sophistication for workers and of communication amongst them. So, uh, so the, these autonomous movements were not just fighting against uh, uh, the domination of the bosses, as it, well, as it were, but they were already in the, in the process of experiencing and trying new forms of production, which involve uh, communicative solidarity and self-determination uh, to some extent, you know, that would have to be extended uh, uh, through the transformation of society. The, I just uh, mentioned this as, as examples of cases in which uh, there was a framework to think about uh, the no, but also the yes that was in process in, in, in these movements. So it, are there equivalents in these uh, social movements that you have been uh, um, looking at? So what, what are the prefigurations uh, at play? Uh, and what, where, where do they come from? What are the practices of, uh, of uh, constructive uh, articulation of, of, of new forms of uh, social life, politics, and so on? Because they, they, they all were very sporadic and, and, uh, and, and very limited in time. And so, um, so anyway, I don't know if this helps, uh, but yeah, no, 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 this is a very good question. Thank you, Paolo. And I'm looking at, you know, uh, we have this, what, what they call the owl, which is a camera. It's yeah. funny because it, it really helps that it has eyes because I can see you, but I- I'm so sorry. I can eyes. see you, you cannot see me, which is a horrible, <laughs> so it's a horrible there's, 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 there's a vague figure of a face that I can look at. Um, can thank thank you, well. Paolo, for that question, because there were a lot of parallelisms and a lot of inspiration from uh, autonomous movements. And even this paper I mentioned, of course, the work of uh, Negri and, and then later Hart and Negri, Holloway, um, and then the Zapatistas and the Argentinians as well, who, who were um, already um, like uh, taking this as part of, 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 uh, of the discourse. These were these ideas were directly inspirational, especially to the Indignado movement. When I was, oh, here's Pablo. That's a way I can relate more to. <laughs> yeah. so, this, is, this is more, more, more natural. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the things that I, that I discovered is that these influences, ten years after 2011, the the uh, the. Um, movements in Argentina in 2001, they had, they, there were a lot of people who had participated there. A lot of Argentinians in, in the movement, Argentines in the movement, a lot of Mexicans uh, and, and Latin Americans. And these ideas were discussed like that. People were looking and drawing from these kind of toolbox of ideas and, um, and um, aesthetics and so on from, from Latin American movements. It was funny because I, it was a little bit embarrassing. They invited me to talks and and that's all they they wanted uh, to ask me. They were like, "Tell us about the Zapatistas," and I was like, "Okay, I think they know more about it than, than myself." <laughs> that, that's something I, I, I discovered. Uh, so, so something that they uh, in, in which they applied is, were of course the occupied uh, houses. So all of the Occupy movement had a, a very strong presence in in the in the 15M movement. And experiments also inspired by the occupied uh, factories in Argentina, and um, and then spaces like this um, that I showed you the the spy um, the, this place in in um, spy Aurea in in uh, Barcelona, which was uh, when I interviewed them like the language that they were using it, it's it, it all comes from auto autonomy and federation uh, horizontality uh, networking. Uh, thinking of power as a complex, hyper complex and interdependent um, flow of ideas and so on. Um, so there were uh, a lot of ideas like that. There were some that were very simple, for example, like I can remember uh, very small gestures that back then didn't feel like much. Like, for example, I was interviewing this person and then he said, like, oh, so I'm in, in charge of, of the bikes, he said. I'm like, oh, what bikes? And he said, like, do you see the bikes uh, in, in the demonstration? There were like five people on bikes and they were, they were uh, pedaling to, to, to generate the energy 
for the sound of, of the uh, of the assembly. And it made me reflect a lot about that, like this this idea, because it was very symbolic. You know, this idea of like kind of like taking over, appropriating that that energy, and then uh, using it, right? So a, a very simple gesture like that you could feel everywhere. There, there was a um, a a community garden right in the middle of Plaza Catalunya, a, a, the Huerto Comunitario. Where they started actually, I and mean, after two months of, of, of occupying, they actually actually started growing some radish and carrots and tomatoes because uh, it was the summer. And so you saw things like that. Some of them were very symbolic because they were always against the odds of being evicted and so on. But there was a very clear, um, a very clear attitude that, uh, and that, like I said, it was very life affirming. It was let's. Let's do this right now. It's like we believe in in um, different um, ways of producing our food and so on. And let's do it right now. The kitchen, for example, the kitchen was it was a very interesting experiment. It, it was run with a volunteer uh, work, donations, but also with so-called recycling people uh, doing dumpster diving. And uh, it sounds like a simple thing, but the kitchen was really the heart of the occupation, both in, in, in Barcelona and in New York City. But in Barcelona, it was fascinating because it was feeding at some point 20,000 people three times a day. And that, that, was, that was an, an achievement. That was an, uh, um, a great um, experiment with autonomy and with testing things and with testing theory directly in the ground. When I was standing online waiting for my soup, this person was telling me, yeah, you, did you know that he was telling me all of this? Like, did you know this is all recycled? And did you know there was, there was this article in the garden that had just um, been published about um, the fact that 50% of all the food that we produce in the world is wasted. That, that, that was a fresh uh, news there. And so he said like, so, so this is, this, it's a political statement to do to do this with so-called um, uh, recycling brigades um, and solidarity brigades and so on, so very small gestures that I feel like in that dispersion that was only natural that happened at some point. These people went on to found projects elsewhere, which are very difficult to track. I realize. Um, but it would be the subject of great uh, research. What happened to that generation? I mean, we yes. know yes. So what happened to-, to Someone to, should do to, that as a research project or, or several people. That would be fascinating. That would be very to track I, have, I know people who've done that, one in, in based in Greece and one based in Italy, uh, but also done work after uh, Indignados in, in, in Spain, who trace like the, the evolution of exactly the projects that were started basically as 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 forms of like daily survival mm -hmm. on the squares and how they evolved into larger commoning practices that became a part of the city. Yeah, oh, that's right. The, the work of Sta yeah. Stavros. Uh, not only part. Stavros, but um, Viviana mm -hmm. um, Viviana Asana, who's mm -hmm. like worked on the Indignados in Spain, and uh, Sta one of Stavros' students, mm -hmm. uh, Agelos. Okay. Agelos is who studied like the Greek experience and and uh, so kind of tracing back how these projects started in the in the square and how they became kind of larger projects that became diffused in the city. So uh, there is some work, but it's really hard to track because it's also one of them dies, but it might kind of inspired yes. another one like that. Yes. So it's like really rhizomatic. So oh, it's very, yeah. very much. So something that was also very inspirational uh, to see was the version of autonomy that Hacking Bay uh, has uh, developed is uh, autonomous, um, temporary autonomous zones, TAS. This notion that autonomy survives in time, although not in space. So it's not that the movement dies, is that it loses the space, but it all of the knowledge, all of the networks, all of the know-how is kept alive and is moved elsewhere. When I was doing research before the research that I mentioned, I, I was studying um, the Occupa movement, the squatter movement, 
And I, I was, there was a demonstration, there was a whole um, action where I could see that uh, in, in a very literal way. They were evicted from a house and then they left. It was, it was, it was a comparatively small for Barcelona, 55,000 people. That's a small demonstration for Barcelona. Uh, moving from that a squatted house and they were chanting, La Rimaya, Esqueda al Barrio, like the, the Rimaya, this, this, this occupation stays in the neighborhood. They were just walking and chanting and chanting. And then they arrived and they occupied another house. And it was a victory. And in the morning it was sad and everything. And then at the end it was saying, I was talking to, to one of the organizers. He said that this is a great victory. And it really made me think of Hacking Bay, this idea that, that the autonomy survives in time and not in space. It, there wasn't even a feeling of like, oh, we lost that space. It's like, all of this is going to be brought all the way here. And that's just within a city. I can't ima imagine, I can imagine like this going everywhere in the world and, and becoming something, the seed of something else. Yeah, that's, those are my examples. Thanks, Pablo. Yes, thank you. Um, just a, a few points first. When you mentioned the, um... What is the role I play in the interdependent network of power? And when we were kind of talking about this, like joining the outrage, there's definite connections with the, and, and you mentioned Zizek, mm -hmm. with the post political, right? Yes. With this kind of, with this idea that, like, we kind of, we just become outraged when, like, the order tells us to. And, like, mm -hmm. we don't really do anything to change the way in which our roles are distributed in this order. So we kind of go out and outrage on the street and then we go home and like we keep doing the same thing. So, um, <clears throat> but it also kind of, in it, it resonates with like, with, with the work of, I think, J.K. Gibson Graham, which talks about capital centricism, mm -hmm. which kind of, well, in a different way, kind of talks about how like all these alternatives to capitalism or the discourses around alternatives to capitalism accepts the centrality of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Always kind of talks about these alternatives in in a language that is the function of capitalism, either like in reactive terms or either kind of very cynical terms, very defeatist terms. So I think like this idea of how um, kind of we start the the struggle kind of almost uh, like already lost, lose the struggle when we start talking about ourselves in the function of the other. So I think this this idea that you're kind of weaving in is being taken up in different you know, literatures. Uh, but what I want to kind of ask is, first of all, I, I mean, two layers to it, I guess, the question. And I like I'm asking it to everyone, I think. Uh, First, what do you think are they beyond the squares movement, but you know, looking more at the kind of contemporary landscape of, of social movements today, uh, what do you think are some of the movements who are able to go beyond this reactiveness? And, and here I'm, I'm mostly thinking about the Zapatistas because obviously it's one, no many yeses are, you know, this no yes is like a, in my mind is, an, is a kind of a obvious reference to Zapatistas. Um, but also kind of, I'm asking this question, I guess, like also kind of to think about the conditions of it. And I, I kind of want to go back to what Nicola said, um, like what creates or what produces this reactiveness and, and beyond like individuals in these movements. Because we, we also kind of talked about how this reactive politics is in a way through reproducing the system or the order is helping kind of the power. So aren't there more institutional structure, real kind of determinants of like this reactiveness that we are kind of, um, we find or our movements find themselves in? Like what are the conditions of the reactiveness or like what are the conditions of going beyond it? Like you've seen many movements, you've seen many examples of like the particular figurativeness for the creative resistance. So what do you think? Like, what do you think for the, what makes it happen? What I made? So one, one of the things that I, I, I think that enables this is, is the internet and the way it works. Um, and 
And uh, the one thing that we all know that is very obvious is that it operates with a binary uh, system. Everything's a zero or a one. Everything's on or off, right? Everything's yes or no. And that's how it, uh, that's how the system understands people, right? So every time you click on a YouTube video, that's a yes, right? That's how the, the, the algorithm understands it. So yes, so for them, for it, uh, if you like this, you like oranges, I'll give you another orange. You don't, uh, if you don't like apples, then now I won't give you apples. I'll give you a bunch of oranges. And then you just keep perpetuating what you think is right. And that's adding to the polarization that we see on both sides. It's like this, I don't know if you've ever seen this ping pong, like professional ping pong players, how they start close to the, to, to the, to the net. And then as they start speeding up in the game, they start going farther and farther. It's happening on both sides. Like, let's, let's be honest. And that is a result of how the discourse is constructed through the internet. So one of the things that I think personally that are very important is, is to go beyond this network that is mostly, it's a network in which the doing is mostly saying. That is, that is one of the main problems. We, we really believe all this, and that's also part of the culture of reactiveness. Someone said that, now I say this. And now I'm a hero because I said this, and this person is a villain. You don't know how this person works, and, and you are just clicking here and not there. And you're just, just participating in this binary of zeros and ones. And that's adding to polarization, it's adding to unproductiveness and the futility of social movements. So we need boots on the ground. Uh, I think that's something that we need to, there, there's, I'm sure there are a lot of, of experiments. Like again, the Zapatistas, I mean, they're doing things online, but experiments like that are, are things that we don't know about in the internet. And yes, again, like, like you mentioned, they, they can be kind of benefic uh, beneficial for, for capitalism because it's like just acknowledging these little asteroids in, the in the galaxy of capitalism, right? Um, but um, I, I think the internet is, is a key thing that we have to understand better if, if we want to to if we don't want we don't want to be trapped in, in reactiveness and and dwelling in resentment and then just fueling the polarization that like I said, is another Tirka's question. It's always like, oh yeah, no, they started it. No, it's like that, <laughs> thing. like we, we're doing it all the time. I don't know if I answered. No, <laughs> just... I mean, yeah, I was just thinking like, it's hard. I was thinking mostly in terms of the square moments. People go out to the square saying no to something, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's what unites them and like kind of, at least my experience in the square has been, it's hard to get into those questions because they create division. Like mm -hmm. people agree on what they say no to and it's easy to do that. Mm -hmm. Everyone is outraged. I, I mean, I'm not. it's not politically useful after a point when you're actually occupying a space and mm -hmm. like you're kind of not named, saying no to anything anymore. Mm -hmm. And then like you see some groups going out and like actually starting fight with the police because like they have to keep saying no to something in order to avoid the harder question of what, what are we saying yes to. But I mean, it's also like the very kind of nature of the square movements is people then go like out of their houses on the neighborhood and said like, hey, we have to enact an alternative. They run to the square because they're like, we're fucking fed up with this so yeah. it's like that is not a easy thing to kind it's of not, yeah, yeah because like one guy will say i'm not here to discuss that i'm here to like be outraged and, mm -hmm. and so I, I feel like those are two different moments or like forms of politicization and yeah. it's not a continuum yeah and so people go like like we say like everybody have their own times right like you can go someone who who's still in that stage of, of outrage, refusal. Um, I, I um, propose that, that we can begin to move on into <laughs> something different. Um, yeah, that, and that was, 
that was the most difficult uh, part, right? like that people start moving away from this chronic um, like th these uh, having assemblies chronically that lasted sometimes for 24 hours. And then you start, I mean, you have the people who stay, who leave once you ask an interesting question and then there are others who stay over and over and then you stay for the, and then it's just chronic and, and then nothing happens. And um, this is what I showed a, 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 a slide very, very quickly here of a demonstration which was uh, what they call the 15 oh, the 15 of October 2011. It was a global demonstration. It was actually, th that is the largest demonstration in terms of the number of people protesting simultaneously all over the world. There has never been so many people protesting at the same time uh, in the world. And it was um, put together by, by all, all of these different movements. This demonstration was huge. There was 200, a quarter of a million people in, in Barcelona, but people all over the world, like really all over the world. Um, and, and in Spain, they were very keen on this idea of teleindignación a la acción, right? which, which is what we see in, in, the, in the banner there. Moving from indignation and outrage into action. At the end, we gather in this, in this, uh, in uh, the Arte Triumph, and, uh, and there were three actions, there were three columns. It was, it was a mess. It was like, okay, and we're gonna go here and we're gonna occupy a hospital and then we're gonna go there and we're gonna, uh, there's gonna be some housing and this, this is gonna focus on housing, this on health and this on education, right? And then you could see that people were really there just to protest. They said like, don't stay here, don't stay. We don't come here to protest. We come here to take action. You have to move into, like who, who signed up for, for the health uh, column? So you're gonna go there. People just stay there, and there are very few people left home to to do something. I mean, th there were some actions uh, taken, but um, but yes, it, it, it's always that challenge because yeah, the, it is it is fun to go <laughs> to these things. I mean, there's music, and, and then there's feeling of like. Stick it to the man and all of that. Yeah, that's that's the, the no moment, right? But there's a moment when you really, when you really have to leave your parents' house. <laughs> I think Nicola has another Nicola. question. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to push back on what you said before. I think it's much more by design than you think, especially in the matter of the internet, which was created as a military tool, of course. Uh, but also that, um, you know, there are many fragments or factions of capitalism, so it makes it more complicated than a simple model of capitalism. Um, but also, um, I mean, Johan, how are you? You wrote a book called Stolen Focus that may be a bit more individual than what we need, but talks about the very purpose of sites like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or whatever else, and how they thrive, they monetize reaction, reactivity. Yeah. Uh, and about the both sides thing, there's a lot to be said about that, which is true, but there's also the fact that it's been shown through experiment that if you create a new uh, profile on YouTube, no matter what you search for, uh, some of the more radical and ridiculous right-wing meaning uh, material will be shown to you in a much faster frequency than others. So there's a certain gambit in the system that skews the words that way. Uh, I myself am a hypocrite because I am on all these social media sites, mm -hmm. but I am for the fact that we should, the revolution will not be built on any of these sites whatsoever. It might be, you know, perpetuated by it, uh, resonated by it a little bit, but ultimately it will not be built on these sites and we need to operate on site. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is, uh, do you see the promise of having these spaces built more of a pluriverse as what Argos Mar and others uh, theorize? Or do you think it needs to be this sort of uh, larger movement that has numbers, albeit sacrificing some of the more uh, 
deeper connections between what really we want of a piece of world. That's a very interesting question. I think, um, well, that first stage, um, the stage of refusal is a stage of acknowledgement. Do you acknowledge that something's wrong? That acknowledgement has to, that awareness needs to continue all of the time. We need to be aware of what we're doing. And the reason why all of these things are happening in the internet is because we're not really aware of what we do. It's just, it, this is fueling on our distraction, our lack of focus, and our um, tendency to react quickly to, to things. And that's a very human thing. Uh, there might be these forces that do it from above, and there are, uh, but we, we it is a very bottom up type of, of process as well. We play a role in that. And until we acknowledge that, we're not gonna change much. So I do think that is one of the arguments in this paper is that we do need a personal uh, transformation. It is imperative. That is that that process of individuation happens because that's when we also start stepping away from uh, from from that uh, reactive we feeling because that is the problem. Like all of this started in a context of again refusal, but there was a strong we feeling in in, in that reaction. So a, a, a kind of, so we, there's already like all this literature of hiding behind ideology, right? It's not that I really believe in this ideology, is that it comes very convenient right, at this period of my life. And this is why, I mean, I, mean, I go a little bit into psych the psychology of it, but we do that all, all the time. It could be that these, going through these stages is not only because the whole humanity is going through these stages. It could be that I am myself going through that stage. And I find that very helpful. Like, what are they saying? No, that's my kind of tips, right? <laughs> because that's what I want to do, right? And it's happened throughout the history of humanity. Maybe you were, I don't know, like in the Middle Ages, maybe there's this, this shy person who lives in this little town and they don't want to talk to anybody. And then they join a convent and they're like, that's what I wanted to do. No, it's convenient. It's just a shy person. You're hiding behind. Like now you're a nun, but, <laughs> but it's this ideology, it, it comes very convenient uh, to you. It comes convenient to us. And it's like I said, we have to go through it. But for me, I think personally, I think it's imperative that we move beyond that we feeling in that uh, from that negative we feeling that we find that as Octavio Paz says that we recognize ourselves in the eyes of the other positively, positively that we look at someone and you say yes, and then you look across the room and you say, I also say yes to that. That to me is a life affirming uh, response. And it entails moving away from, look at what they're doing to us, which is happening, but we need to move away from that, I think. No. Yeah, I thank you so much for your talk. I guess one final point on that last thing you stated. First of all, I thought, one of the things I was thinking about was, you know, here in the cosmopolitan movement, we recently have felt, you know, that's what came out of it. And uh, reflecting on that moment, it, it's really passed since that time. It's yeah. been a real, you know, a dissolution of the collective, that kind of way of collective organizing. And, but I'm trying to remember what was particularly significant in that moment. And I mean, I think refusal, which you have acknowledged just a minute ago, was this kind of, there is a conscious reason that happens that I think is quite significant. And it breaks somebody out of a kind of ideological stasis, right? Like that does kind of reset, no, it doesn't have to be this way. So I feel like it does a bit more than just react. I feel like it opens the possibility. For something significantly different. But simultaneously, I think 
you're familiar with cooperation yeah like their project is one that looks to simultaneously um in the challenge of prevailing capitalist to down, top down race system right but but to build as well like to build this different cooperatives in jackson mississippi which you can basically is in the part time at the moment the right water crisis and, and this builds on a strong long legacy of it but um but their their reaction to this is the state has failed us the government has failed us and we have to build our own uh kind of productive capacity as well as you know, our networks of support and so there's a system of cooperatives too that they're constructing that they always never lose sight of this idea of what's true simultaneously bringing down through the establishment not just of national networks but transnational kind of alliances right and with like-minded movements to try to protect themselves and hold goals to distinguish this very just building it all to be manipulated uh, in a very mobilized way and then it's insufficient. Mm -hmm. And so they, they simultaneously by the number of really little product. Now, I mean, that just looks, I just, I'll end on this one thing, but like, you know, Jackson is based on water crisis there recently. And it becomes apparent that they are still so isolated. So under service and under support, even with the attempts to like to do all this. And the so the challenges are so quite pressing. But I don't know, I just I do find so fascinating that this two talk way that doesn't they doesn't see them as separate, but actually mm -hmm. kind of, you know, interconnected. And I wondered about like how you know, maybe. And I don't know what the answer is. It's more like, it, but I find it quite provocative, this idea of trying to think about both. Yeah, I, I think I think there's definitely, I think that no, I mean, as you say yes, you keep saying no mm -hmm. to something else. Uh, yeah. you, your yes is a way to say no in a proactive way, is actually engaging in something. So I, I but while there are still links and uh, and you're chained into an oppressive power. You need to uh, to keep saying no in in a, in that traditional uh, way. But yeah, that, that, there is definitely something that can happen simultaneously. Um, and yeah, the the question here, I think. One of the main motivations of, of, of the study and the article was the the effectiveness, basically. Like how effective is it? How productive is it when we articulate uh, a certain uh, discourse? And and again, what are the attitudes that we need to cultivate among a movement? Because there, there's a, another thing that is that is. Uh, that is now it's sadly becoming part of, of progressive um, movements which is this this culture of of calling out within the movement just destroying people and the, and and the reason why they listen to you is because they partly agree with you so it is very it's very pervasive and it's very um negative and not productive and I think futile ultimately. Uh, I didn't know about that um, movement. Um, we have another question? Yes. Oh, uh, it's not a well, it's question, but it's mm -hmm. um, I went through this as a young mm -hmm. environmental and climate activist in the 2000s and starting the late 90s in the, in the, in the pre globalization movement. And then becoming quite involved in the climate movement and you know to the point of like sitting in a you know I was part of the planning committee for the 2005 demonstration during the UN climate conference in Montreal and in the months leading up to that I was in my early 20s and I was studying social movements and my sociology degree here and working with various NGOs like 
Greenpeace and Sierra Club and all those different groups to organize this demonstration. And I remember trying to articulate, like, what do we want? What are we asking for? You know, why, why are we doing this? What is the point? You know, and then studying Gandhi and, and Martin Luther King and, and asking that question during a planning meeting. And the, re the response was, we don't have time for that right now. We don't have time to answer that question. We don't have time to get into that discussion. We just need to mobilize people. Mm -hmm. And I remember just sitting there being like, what? And then I remember standing beside the stage during the during the demonstration, which turned out, you know, was a big success. There were 30 or 40,000 people there. It was, you know, pretty huge at the time. And I remember standing there and looking at the crowd and looking at the speakers and looking at the, the you know, the Palais or whatever that where the UN meetings were happening and being part of that whole thing. And just kind of standing there and being like, what is the point of this right now? Like, it doesn't line up with what I've been studying from Gandhi and from Martin Luther King Jr. that we're not asking for anything. Mm -hmm. We're not saying we want this. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get it, then we'll do this. Yeah. And if we don't get it, then we'll do that. And that's what I found in the climate movement and the environmental movement in general is very abstract, They're very idealist. Mm -hmm. And the answer was, we just want action on climate change. And that continued for all. It was like, well, what is action on climate change? Like, let's break it down and get specific. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the problem that social movements fall into is they want idealistic, abstract notions of change mm -hmm. and have, have a challenge in breaking that down into like, we want this specific thing and we're going to work until we get that specific thing. And then we will move on to the next target, right? And so, and that abstraction, it can be both intoxicating and a turn off at the same time mm -hmm. people can end up, I just want to fight, you know, mm -hmm. and then, but also like, what are we fighting for? And so I've seen that go on for years and it still continues to this day. Um, and and then there's the ego of the environment, of, of movements. And then people say, we want to be first in line and we want to be mm -hmm. you know, leaders. So I think that that moving from abstract to specific and then moving from short to long term mm -hmm. is like part of the mix because seeing this, you know, continuity and relationships and like the idea that we're still going to be here next year, we're still going to be here in five years, we're still going to be here in 10 years. And how do we, how do we interact and engage with that idea of like still being here would change how people relate because it often comes down to just human relationships and people just get in fights and throw each other off. And, and then, you know, the momentum breaks down and it kind of scatters um so and then this idea like it, it i think of joanna macy so when i learned about her it was a huge oh okay this is already been thought about and she articulates you know she was an anti-nuclear activist who was facing these same things like what are we doing what are we fighting against and she articulated this triangular model of you know you have people that are resisting you have people that are trying to create the alternative and you have people that are doing the spiritual work, the consciousness work mm -hmm. of, you know, ceasing to be dualistic and seeing that yes is no, and no is yes, and there's always this. And then we move from camp to camp mm -hmm. in our lives and depending on our circumstances. Mm -hmm. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then Nancy Frazier from the New School, her work on um, affirmative versus transformative strategies for change is another way to follow movement. Like some movements are just trying to improve and or diminish the imbalance or the oppressiveness of a particular issue. And then some movements are trying to change the landscape entirely, trying to change the paradigm entirely. But often those movements end up fighting with each other and saying, mm -hmm. you're not doing it right. Like, or you're not doing it enough. Yeah, exactly. Or this won't matter. But rather than seeing how one leads to the other or can lead to the other, if it's leveraged, but often, you know, it's not leveraged because they end up saying, like, this is a stupid waste of time when this is the real issue over here. Instead of going, how is this connected to that? And that's, you know, that our institutions are, are founded on competition and separation. Like it, it, you know, the very notion of grading, which starts when we're five years old, you know, 
that all it, it, it bakes the notion of separation and competition and class into us. So, you know, I, I you know, I think that initiatives like this, like a social justice center that brings together people from different disciplines and that, you know, try to break that down is a helpful step. But just, yeah, like the, the most people don't know about it, right? Most people don't know about these ideas, haven't considered them. And that's one piece that I've always found. That's where I think is really like the opportunity, the potential you brought up Hollywood. You know, stories are very powerful. Stories can be very inspiring. They can make us see and imagine something that we have never thought about before. And that's, I think, why we attribute so much power to celebrity and to actors, because they can radically change our lives. You know, when I saw American Beauty when I was 18, it radically impacted my worldview and made me question everything that I was kind of taking for granted up to that point. You know, and that's something that is diffuse, can be spread around the world. The internet can facilitate that, but it's often something that social movements don't always connect with with artistic movements and translating and getting creative and creating new stories that then inspire people and kind of, you know, that, that my mother always said you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar, but I find our movements are often very sour and that the no side can be very mm -hmm. sour and the yes side can be very sweet. Is it uh, blending? Thank you. Thank you so much for the, sharing that experience. I think, I mean, thinking about the concrete and the abstract and the vague and specific, something I learned uh, throughout this, I mean, throughout my whole life is that sometimes some of the most creative things would come from people that don't even come, call themselves uh, political or uh, activists. They're doing creative, very, they, they just see as people, themselves as people who's, who are doing what they what what needs to be done. And um, so in that sense, I think that can also be very life affirming when someone thinks beyond that stroke, that intoxicating uh, moment of feeling okay. See, it, it is, it is something that that is intoxicating at some point. And uh, and like you said, people don't stay in, in the long-term struggle um, because they're there for, for the hype, right? It was fun uh, during the US 132, it was a very powerful movement, it very well networked, coordinated with all the movements like this, like the Montreal movement is still connected. I was listening about the strike in Mexico City in, happening in parallel with the Quebec, I can only think that it was coordinated, the Chilean students as well. But then they dispersed, they, they interviewed them in the media, they were like, oh, it was such a fun summer to have, it was great, it was the summer of my life. And then uh, Subcomandante Marcos Bet, he wrote about it, he said, this, this was the storming of the Winter Palace uh, in, on vacation. <laughs> yeah, let's do this, it's a lot of fun, now let's go home. <laughs> So that emotional part of social movements is it's important to talk about it because it, it is it is a, um, yeah that that's why I brought up adolescence and I know that it's uncomfortable but but there's a point where we have to think about that and and how do we become how do we transcend that is it doesn't I mean going back to that metaphor it doesn't mean that you will always be your anti moment anti moment anti dad right. There's a moment when you would realize, okay, they were doing some things that I actually do agree with. Because yeah. I am, I don't, I no longer define myself as the opposite of them. Mm -hmm. I had to go through that moment of differentiation, but that is gone. And that, when does that happen? When you leave your house, when you become a parent yourself, <laughs> <laughs> so on. <laughs> That's when you're like, okay, there's no one else to, or when they die, right? When they die, then who do you blame? Now, it, now you're on your own. <laughs> yeah, very shortly, I think, like now I'm thinking, and, and like as Mama said, like cooperation, that's, which is kind of one kind of synergy of like saying no. And like in Cooperation Jackson's case, it's very 
specifically like saying no to reduce harm, like reduce harm so that we can, like we actually have people are alive to discuss what is yes. And, and I don't think it's like, it's a coincidence that Cooperation Jackson is like building on the black liberation tradition and like all the other examples I can think of who are kind of saying no to say yes, or like mm -hmm. to be able to articulate a yes are the Kurdish freedom movement. Mm -hmm. They're yep. like from the start, they had an alternative way of social sociality, of, of politics, of how to self-govern and, and what, what kind of an economy they want to build. And that's like an ongoing discussion and deliberation and politics throughout like years and decades of, of resistance. And and the other one is the Batistas, which is like there are many parallels. Again, like it's kind of saying no to open space up to so say yes. And um Mondragon, which is like the largest conglomerate of cooperatives in Spain, was started in the connection with the Basque uh independence movement. Mm -hmm. So they were saying no while and like saying no to say yes, but also very explicitly in the context of the Kurdish freedom movement and the, and Mondragon as well, that they have to start building the new paradigm in order to be able to say no more. And that's like the connection with the autonomous, right? If you don't build your autonomous uh, services. The reality. Yeah. yeah, and then like if you have to rely on what you're fighting in order to reproduce yourself then you won't be able to say no strongly enough so i think there's so it's like it's not the square moments it's not the it's like it's always like a national liber or like kind of some liberation moments who are also i mean kind of building the yes so i mm -hmm. feel like zapatista's kurdish freedom movement the the basque independence Black liberation, they kind of they're fighting against the white kind of white colonial capitalist mm -hmm. paradigm in a way. I think they start more systemically in like I think I don't know like I think there's something yeah. that they share. I'm not quite sure what, but and and I would I and it's what well, well that moment is necessary. The the. Next moment, I would think is when we start when 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 we can articulate things beyond white colonial and so on. And in the literature about um, the city and power, um, there are a lot of mentions about like all of these structures of power that are shaping our our discourse. Um, well, the main the mention the bourgeoisie, the the capitalism, the patriarchy, and so on. It, it, it develops this 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 uh, tendency to do again that that um, idea that that the devil works in mysterious way. The devil is always out there, right? Like it's it's over there. It's I am doing this because they're doing that. So um, and it is not easy. Yeah, I would say like, I, I, these are questions that that. That, that that haunt me. Thanks, Peggy. Rachel. I just wanted to make an observation. I hope this is based with that. I was thinking about the and whatnot, and I noticed that. Well, the, I realized that I actually really like TV. Okay, so I noticed that there's a bit of a trend in what I'm seeing and enjoying the most because it's kind of like a. Like an anti hero protagonist, where they're a hacker, they're living in New York City, they're online. <laughs> and it's like, I'm, tell, I'm saying this because it kind of it, the, the story is about the individual and the kind of just like rejection of connecting with larger groups to actually get things done. I'm thinking of miserable law taking on like systemic, uh, <laughs> and then also, um, even Russian doll. Where they're they're, just, they're actually exploring like time and space. She's also in there on the computer, and this is kind of like the way the the story of like taking things into your own hands. Yeah. Because, and I, I I see that as a rejection. Ultimately, like the story of like I can't do anything by myself, or like your your own worst enemy. But they're still the protagonist, and they still like I I think it's quite telling because. I feel super uninterested in participating in large 
protest because it just seems like a, like it's going to be a really sour experience of no and like one your day will come where you say the wrong thing and then you're outcasted like i just and then and then we talk about what norma was talking about in, in the city where it's a tangible experience like this is the problem and this is us reacting collectively like there's actually the shared goal that maybe they don't have the resources to accomplish like what's needed like clean water but there is a shared understanding of like what needs to be done and an agreement hopefully on how to do those things where like i was i just think me and my classmates don't really see like experience shared experiences in the same way that people that were protesting even in the 90s would be familiar with right like it just seems like a like yeah well thanks for your theory but we still have like environmental degradation and i still don't have like housing that's like secure yeah thanks for all the marches so, like, here we write it on the paper about it i don't care well, well there there is yeah no exactly um it resonates to things i've seen and felt myself there is this feeling i think that it also relates to this so-called crisis of loneliness crisis of crisis of of, uh, of uh, alienation it's it's another version of the of the feeling of alienation when we think about it in terms of political economy um there is there is a uh, like a balkanization of interests and things and it's difficult to put together something it is there's this feeling like you said there was this shared feeling this, this we feeling in the 90s it's true and then you mentioned tv which is also and 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 i assume that you don't you mean tv like what tv used to be that feeling strangely gave a sense i mean i'm not talking about tv in particular but media in particular in general it gave a sense of of a certain shared, uh, view. shared view right of, of, of a zeitgeist that you share now everything is pulverized everything has their own um playlist and they're interested in this obscure mm -hmm. artist and in this obscure uh, cause and then when you want to bring people together, you can't do it. And the, the internet is, is also uh, one of the main causes of that. It, it, it is really frustrating. I mean, and I feel like I'm seeing it developing. Like uh, you try to organize something and like, you know, I'm really, what I'm really interested in is this uh, cause of, uh, in Uzbekistan, there is this, oh, okay, so I'm not joining the march of mm -hmm. climate change or whatever. I really like this band from the 90s, uh, so and so and so. And then if it's a meal, uh, there's so many dietary restrictions, so you can't put together a freaking um, party, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So there is definitely that, that feeling of, of uh, pulverization and balkanization of, of interests and causes and shared worldviews that, that I think is fueling alienation. We, I think the crisis of loneliness, which is huge. I mean, when we talk about this, um, we don't see the uh, how serious it is. I mean, the, the, in, during Theresa May, they, they they appointed the the, the Ministry of Loneliness. Like it, it is, it was a ministry. It wasn't. A sub, it, it was there was money allocated for someone in charge of the crisis of loneliness, which relates to to. I think it, it it's it's an iteration of alienation, and. Uh, I don't see a way out. I, I. Well, we overthrow the system. That's the way out. Yeah. I don't <laughs> but but is is there a way to 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 have those people in the same no. room? I wish. I mean, I really. I would really like to see I mean, that. Like, like that there part is... of the square movements, like it's not only the sticking it to the men, but I think it's also kind of people rediscovered being in comp, like being, being together. together. Yeah, yeah, just like spending the nights together. Like it's, and it's like, it's not a, it's not a coincidence that it, it, it always happens in a plaza, which is like in little neighborhood plazas, that's what people do. Like they come and like they have their exactly. like, tea together or whatever. So, 
at least in Istanbul, like a lot of the white color kind of, of like middle class youth was just like enjoying being in the park together and like kind of constructing some kind of common life, which is like completely fragmented and, and you know, erased out of urban life and everyday spaces now. Um, so it's also, I think people enjoy that. And that was kind of a common experience. I, I think the emotional part is, is really important. That's why I cite in these papers all this poetry. Again, going back to Octavio Paz, that famous verse, which is actually an erotic uh, um, poem. El mundo cambia cuando dos se miran y se reconocen. The, the world changes when two look at each other and recognize uh, themselves. So that recognizing ourselves in the eyes of the other is something that, that, is, that is suffering in this climate of balkanization, of pulverization of different interests and so on. And we need to find ways to, to do that again. And, 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 and uh, it was very interesting you mentioned that, that work you mentioned where there is, I was thinking mind, body, and spirit, really. Like all of these things are, like you really need to keep that 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 spiritual um, dimension of it. Mm -hmm. I would say. You had another. Uh, I was gonna say like I was kind of driving around the plot the other day, which is a bad idea, um, <laughs> and joking that you know that I think the secret objective of of, of Father Montreal in the plateau, especially, is to turn the plateau into an actual maze. Where you have to like find yeah. your way in and find your way out. And it's, it was it was like reach absurd level where I was like, there's no signs. I don't know where I'm going. I'm going in like circles three times now, and I've lived there for ten years, so I know it pretty well. But what it's doing is creating a, 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 a an environment, you know, conducive to human interaction that is unconducive to vehicular. Traffic, which is like, you know, our cities are designed around isolation and they're designed to keep us separate. There is a literal zone of death surrounding every single block. Like you can literally get killed every time you step outside by accident if you're not careful. So that's the baseline psychology of the city. So that is what's operating kind of constantly on, you know, as part of the, the physical layer of a political economy, which privileges all of these things we don't want, right? But I find what's interesting in the sustained kind of maintenance of power of an organization that has human and environmental objectives is that in through they you know fought against the resistance against the decarbonization of the environment to create spaces that are now conducive to human interaction. And in but the, I mean, certain humans, right? I mean, there's also that. <laughs> oh, there's for sure still the, the, yeah, for sure the limitations and 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 all the issues of gentrification. Or that. I'm not denying. That. No, no. I mean, not only gentrification. It's also like it's. I mean, I think it's. Yeah, the, I mean, like on the one hand, what Jorge Monreal is doing is not new, but also very much welcome. But like the fact that it's being done in Plateau is also kind of speaks in itself, no? Like Plateau is super wide, super upper middle class. Like it's I not mean, everyone who's like expected to yeah. encounter each other there. Yeah, anyway. but it's interesting too, because it's kind of like, that's why it, it, you have to think long-term again, right? And, and not be too critical. That's my, always my critique of academia. It's like, Okay, like we and of the left, right? It's like you can critique it all day long, and you'll end up with you'll have whittled it down to nothing, and then you have nothing, right? Like you have to take, you know, look at okay, what are the positive aspects, and you know, and yes, we have to critique the the, the poor parts about it, but I can't say oh, you shouldn't have done it at all. You should have done it in you know, like Villema or something, where you know, in my own research, they tried to do projects in. Uh, environments that weren't suitable and then they failed and then they used that as an example. Like, see, it doesn't work. You can't do that. So that can be instrumentalized by, you know, neoliberal power structures to be like, it, it won't work because you try to grow a seed in a desert environment. And it's like, it didn't work. So the seed's not viable. So, but what I was going to say was, um, no, I lost I was going somewhere with the, the, with the maze, but with the, the, the square, like it's it's a we go there because it's a place where you're everyone's welcome or it's public, 
and you're not at risk of getting killed by a random passing vehicle. So I think there's that dimension of this, that that's why this square inherently kind of leads to, like I thought about this, the architecture, how does architecture and urban design entrench, you know, systems of power and systems of, of isolation or whatever versus liberatory, you know, architectures or planning that just by its nature facilitates you know, I thought about that during my undergrad in a sociology class and thinking we're all sitting in rows facing this authority in front, critiquing capitalism. Like right? we're recreating it right now, you know, like and the seats are anchored in place. Like the university's architecture is a structure to support that domination of one authority and many followers. So how can we subvert, you know, whip up the, under the, you know, under the, what is it, under the cobblestones of the beach? You know, that. That, I think that's in, in many ways that one of the motivations, one of the reasons why I arrived to this stage myself was that uh, experience of being at all, having a background as an architect and a designer, which is a very, say life affirming type of profession. Mm -hmm. You can't be like dubious and shy if you're an architect. You, when you say something, you have to say it. You mm -hmm. have to you have to take uh, you have to use your voice, recognize that you have a voice and you have to take it. And that feeling I felt was at odds with this life than I thing of like, let's don't do this. Uh, we're gonna hurt you. We're gonna like, uh, um, yeah, like the, those examples of when they're trying to <laughs> in India uh, the, and the gens don't, don't let people kill because they're gonna kill the worms, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, you do have, that's where I was coming from when I said, you do have an existential footprint. Let's make it. Let's make it worth. That's what I think. And with that, I would like to. Yeah, Pablo is saying thank no. you. He just left. Uh, he's thanking you, and we can all thank you too. <laughs>